gentlemen, we welcome you to Paris's prestigious La Villette Center for Science and Industry and present our host for this international television event, Mr. Telly Savalas. Welcome to Paris and to the adventure of a lifetime. On a bitterly cold night in 1912, the Royal Mail steamer RMS Titanic, the greatest ocean liner of the day, struck an iceberg on her maiden voyage to New York and plunged two and a half miles to the bottom of the Atlantic. Of the 2,207 people aboard, 1,502 lost their lives. The worst maritime disaster in peacetime history. It was the end of an era and the beginning of a legend. Of the 705 survivors, some in the few lifeboats, some clinging to wreckage, most watched in horror as the enormous ship, lights ablaze virtually to the end, plunged to the bottom. When the Titanic disappeared on that cold April night, no one dared to dream any trace of her would be seen again. Yet, you are passengers in tonight's voyage and will Return to the Titanic in a spectacular dive to the bottom with the best deep sea diving team in the world today. The underwater experts of the French Institute Ifremer. Tonight, we will show you for the first time artifacts which have been lost to the world for more than 75 years. We will reveal new evidence which could explain why the Titanic went down. And we will open the recovered safe and valise and discover what surprises they contain. So, stay with us. from Paris, France, and the La Villette Center for Science and Industry. Here again, your host, Telly Savalas. The Titanic was different. She was the biggest, the best, the most luxurious. You fill in the superlatives, she was all of them. Most of all, people called her unsinkable. When she went down, the disaster was so stunning that overnight, the word changed from unsinkable to unthinkable. The world learned a lot about the arrogance of technical expertise. Most of the rich during the Edwardian era never felt any reason to conceal the trappings of wealth. They wore their luxurious furs, their elaborate jewelry, like badges of honor and emblems of identity. The gowns required by a lady of elegance took weeks of handwork, embroidery, and beading. Moving them around required dozens of trunks, bags, satchels, valises. The entire generation had come to accept this opulence, this flamboyant display, as a way of life that would never end. The story of the Titanic really begins in one of the most important townhouses in London. It's called Downshire House. It stands where it always has, in London's fashionable Belgrave Square. In May 1907, it was the scene of a very important dinner party. It was then the home of Lord William James Peary, chairman of Holland and Wolfe, one of the great shipbuilding firms of Britain, and for many years, shipbuilders to the White Star Line, one of the world's leading steamship companies. And coming to dinner that night, J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line. Before the evening is over, They'll agree to build a series of transatlantic liners so enormous, they'll dwarf every other ship afloat. For elegance, comfort, and size, they'll be unrivaled. The Olympic and the Titanic will be the first two of these giant ships. 
They'll be built here at Holland and Wolf's Yards in Belfast, Ireland. The green hills of Belfast still produce the army of shipbuilders Harland and Wolf have put to work for 125 years here at its Queen's Island Works. It was at this location that the Olympic, the Titanic, and later the Britannic were built. By March 1909, in specially built gantries which tower over Harland and Wolf's Belfast yards, construction is well underway on the first ship, the Olympic. Coming fast alongside her sister ship, the Titanic. So immense are these two liners that they occupy space normally used for the construction of three ships. Everything that goes into them is the best and often the biggest that money can buy. From their 30-foot panels of heavy steel plating to their three-story high reciprocating engines, everything is state-of-the-art. These double-bottomed, triple-screw giants are built to be unsinkable. Lord Peary and Bruce Ismay do nothing to discourage the public's impression that the liners are, in fact, unsinkable. By the spring of 1911, the workforce at Holland and Wolf approaches 15,000 people and the first two ships are nearing completion. Weighing in at 46,000 tons, the Titanic has become the largest moving object ever built by man. If stood on end, she would be even higher than the world's then tallest skyscraper, New York's Woolworth Building. Every link in her anchor chain weighs 175 pounds. It took a team of 10 horses to pull this anchor through the streets of Belfast. May 31st, 1911, more than 100,000 people turned out to see the Titanic launched. Now, if you thought a bottle of this excellent French champagne was smashed over the bow the day the Titanic was launched, you'd be wrong. In the long tradition of the White Star Line, none of its ships was ever christened, including the Titanic. At 13 minutes past noon, the release lever was pulled, and it took the Titanic just over a minute to slide gracefully into Belfast's River Lagan. The Titanic inspired many myths. One of the most fanciful of them involved the curse of the mummy case. In 1910, British Egyptologist Douglas Murray was approached in Cairo by a mysterious American who sold him a mummy case. It had been the casket of a 16th century BC high princess of Amman Ra, a powerful woman in the cult of the dead. She had left behind an evil curse on anyone who despoiled her grave. First to feel it, the American who died before he could cash Douglas Murray's check. Murray laughed. But three days later, his gun exploded, blowing his arm off. Now heading back to England, two friends of Murray's mysteriously died. Also two servants. Now, back in England, he gave it to a woman friend. Her mother died suddenly. Her lover deserted her. And the woman came down with a mysterious wasting disease. Her lawyer said, give it back to Murray. And Murray, it was said, gave it to the British Museum. Almost immediately, the museum's photographer and Egyptian director dropped dead. The British Museum was losing its charm. Rumor had the board arranging to unload it on a New York museum. Fortunately for New York, the mummy's case never got there. There are those who firmly believe that she was in the cargo hold of the unsinkable Titanic when she took more than 1,500 people to the bottom on April 15, 1912. A fascinating yarn, but a lot closer to mystery than history, or is it? In a moment, we will return to the Titanic to see the treasures recovered from the ocean floor. prestigious center for science and industry, La Valette. Here again, Kelly Savalas. One of the most important men at the launching 
was an American, billionaire banker J. Pierpont Morgan. J. P. Morgan had a very special interest in the Titanic. In fact, you might call it a controlling interest. He held enough stock in the American corporation, which owned the White Star Line, to make the Titanic an American ship. Oh, by the way, J. P. Morgan will later change his mind and cancel his plans for sailing on the Titanic's maiden voyage. Holland and Wolf were determined to make the Titanic not only luxurious, but unique. It even had a French sidewalk cafe, which added to an already stylish ship, as our friends here say in Paris, a soupçon of panache. Edith Heisman was 15 when she was put off the sinking ship into a lifeboat. She too remembers the Titanic well. It's a really a very beautiful ship. Uh, the uh, staircase of the first class is really beautiful. And um, the second class is as good as the first. Just as beautifully laid the tables were. And the most beautiful paintings were up on the wall. Then they had their swimming baths and um, gymnasium for people and children's play place. It's really a, it was a floating palace. When fully outfitted, the cost of this floating palace will reach seven million five hundred thousand dollars. Today's equivalent, ninety million dollars. On April second, nineteen twelve, finally complete, the Titanic prepares to steam out of Belfast Lock for her trials. Smoke never comes from the fourth funnel, except in paintings. It's a dummy used for ventilation. White Star knows that the public associates power with a number of funnels on a ship. Too bad they didn't spend the money on lifeboats. Oh, about the lifeboats. The original design calls for 64. This is later cut to 32, and later still to 16. After all, you'll never need lifeboats on an unsinkable ship. As the Titanic followed this route out of Belfast on its way to England, a smoldering fire was discovered in a coal bunker. As we will learn tonight, this fire could have a major impact on our story. RMS Titanic is under the command of White Star's senior captain E.J. Smith, who has delayed his retirement just long enough to take the ship on her maiden voyage to New York and back. With his distinctive white mustache and beard, his regal bearing an air of authority, Captain Smith is the perfect model of the British ship's master. The Titanic tied up at Beast 34 here in Southampton only once to take on provisions and passengers for her maiden voyage. For the five days before they arrive, the Titanic will be the center of furious activity. Crewmen are signed on by the dozens, stokers, trimmers, cooks and waiters only Southampton's best sail with Captain Smith. Provisions enough for a town are taken aboard. 43 tons of meat and fish, 2,000 quarts of ice cream, 1,200 pounds of marmalade, 1,500 bottles of champagne and other fine wines. A cigar after dinner? Not to worry. There are 8,000 of these aboard. Soon we'll be diving with the French expedition to recover hundreds of items which the world thought were lost forever. But first, we'll return to the Titanic as she sails from Southampton for her voyage into eternity. Sponsored in part by Quaker Oatmeal, it's the right thing to do. Live from Paris, the city of life, and La Villette Center for Science and Industry, here again, Mr. Telly Savalas. For those eager passengers who waited for Titanic sailing day, April 10th, 1912 was a long time coming. But as the great day dawned, all of Southampton was charged with excitement at last, 
sailing day. The creme de la creme of society has arrived to take its place aboard the floating palace. Among the notables were this couple, Isidore Strauss, founder of Macy's, and Mrs. Strauss. Colonel John Jacob Astor, one of America's richest men. Mining tycoon, Benjamin Guggenheim. Mrs. J.J. Brown, a colorful, tough-talking millionaire from Denver. She was known to her friends as Molly. The Cardassus of Philadelphia, they're traveling light. They arrive with only a valet and maid, 14 trunks, four suitcases, and three crates of baggage. One observer estimates the collective worth of Titanic's celebrated first class at three billion in today's American dollars. Almost everyone was excited by the approaching voyage. Ava Hartho remembers a mother's fear. Uh, young as I was, I knew that there was this something in the air about it because my mother was so terribly upset at the thought of going because she had this premonition of danger, but she didn't, couldn't think what it was. And we weren't booked in the Titanic anyway. We were booked in a ship called the Philadelphia. And there was a coal strike and she didn't sail. And we were transferred to the Titanic, which every th thing, everyone thought was a wonderful piece of luck. But that's when my mother's apprehension became worse. And she said to my father, I think I know now why I'm frightened. And he said, well, what is it? She said, because this is the ship that they say is unsinkable. And he put his arm around her shoulders, and I can see this quite clearly. And he said, no, my dear, this is the ship that is unsinkable. And she said, well, that is flying in the face of God, and that's why I'm frightened. Seconds before noon, she sounds the three traditional blasts of farewell. After calling at Cherbourg for passengers, she's underway again for Ireland and a final stop at Queenstown before the crossing. As Ireland fades in the mist, their hopes and dreams are of the new world, not of the next. Time passes quickly for most of the voyage. The Titanic is following the Great Circle route. This northern route is the shortest and fastest way to New York. She gives her passengers the best band on the ocean and plenty to keep them busy. It's not inexpensive. For a seven-day crossing, her four top suites cost the equivalent of 320,000 present-day dollars. In the Titanic's lookout, a full-time ice watch has been ordered to full alert 20 minutes before midnight, April 14th, the Titanic is shaken by a very distant jolt. Passengers above have no idea what's happening below the waterline. What is it? Iceberg, sir. I put a harder sub and reversed the engines, but she was too close. I splashed my drink. What have we stopped for? There's talk of an iceberg, ma'am. We are in a precarious position. We must be prepared to abandon ship. By midnight, Captain Smith knows the worst. In seconds, the ship has been fatally wounded. Despite the double bottom, the watertight doors, the compartmented bulkheads, despite the highest art of the shipbuilder, the Titanic will be on the bottom in less than three hours. Captain Smith also knows that the ship carries lifeboats for less than half the passengers. By 12.30, Captain Smith orders the lifeboats loaded. Women and children first. Bertram Dean was only a child on that fateful night, but he remembers what his father did. My father helped us into the lifeboat. And then it was women and children only. He said, well, cheerio, I'll see you later. But of course, we never saw him anymore. Distress signals are urgently sent. Other ships are in the vicinity. For the first time in history, the SOS is sent by a liner. The Californian lies safely at a dead stop less than 10 miles away. No answer. 
a wireless operator has gone to bed. Within minutes, the line of Carpathia wires back. She's 58 miles away and coming hard. From the nearby Californian, which was clearly visible, still only silence. At 2.20 a.m., April 15, 1912, the RMS Titanic slipped quietly beneath the surface. The sinking of... The sinking of the RMS Titanic began with a small jolt, but its impact rocked the world, and the aftershock is felt today. Nothing would ever again be the same. The world had lost its innocence. The newspapers around the world began to receive news of the disaster with as much disbelief and confusion as the public. On both sides of the Atlantic, relatives and friends besieged the White Star offices, desperately waiting, hoping, praying that their news would be good. It would be several days before the world would learn the truth. In Southampton, home to more than 800 of the Titanic's crew, these neighborhoods were thrown into shock and grief. 580 of them perished. In this Southampton elementary school, 125 children lost one of their parents. Disbelief gave way to grief, and it was universal. St. Mary's Church was the scene of a memorial service attended by hundreds. A memorial plaque to the ship's crew still hangs in an honored location. In a moment, we'll return to reveal for the first time new historical evidence which may provide the real reason that a Titanic sank. We'll be <laughs> When the Titanic plunged to her grave more than 75 years ago, no one believed she would ever be seen again. Until recently, most felt the Titanic was sunk by a 300-foot-long can opener-like gash, ripped in her side as she grazed the iceberg. In 1986, one expert claimed the iceberg impact had popped rivets and sprung steel plates, causing the fatal flooding. Now, for the first time ever, we've discovered and photographed the most startling new evidence since the disaster a previously unknown hole at this point in the starboard bow. Coming across the well deck by the bridge front, we pass over two starboard bollards, across the starboard rail and down the side of the ship. Here, extending down to near the waterline, a dramatic 30-foot hole, strongly believed to have possibly been caused by an internal explosion, our expedition found. No long slit, no sheared rivets, no sprung plates. Here, in the most dramatic and revealing views, inside the bowels of the once mighty Titanic, we witness an area extending almost three decks down into the ship. 
This area is extremely difficult to pinpoint precisely, although it has been confirmed by naval architects at Holland and Wolf, builders of the Titanic, after examining the original blueprints of the ship, to be similar to an area above a reserve coal bunker. That bunker would lie at the bottom of the ladder plainly in view. The exposed decks may have contained the Titanic's mail boat. This at least is the best guess of the naval architects who admit something strange happened here. But these pictures alone do not provide enough information for positive conclusions. We now have solid evidence that Captain Smith knew about the coal fire from the time the Titanic left Belfast. He signed a false statement denying this knowledge in Southampton and possibly in Cherbourg and Queenstown. This long smoldering fire now raises the question of a possible explosion at the time of impact with the iceberg. Possibly from accumulated combustion gases set off by a spark from electrical wiring broken when the bulkhead was pierced. Possibly from coal dust or from steam when cold water hit the red hot coals in the bunker. We have two gentlemen with us in Paris tonight who have special knowledge which may help to evaluate this new and critical evidence. First, Mr. White William Dybell, a former naval officer, engineer, and Seattle, Washington businessman, who heard his father tell a very unusual story about the Titanic as he returned from France after World War I. Mr. Dybell, nice to have you here. Thank you. Tell me, what did you hear your father say, Mr. Dybell? Well, he claimed that the Titanic, in fact, never struck an iceberg. And in fact, the, she sank as a result of an explosion that developed from a fire in a coal bunker that had been burning from prior to when the ship sailed from Southampton. Now, he was a sergeant in the Army in World War I and heard this story firsthand from a crewman on the U.S. troop ship SS Mercury. This man claimed to have been a survivor, a uh, surviving stoker of the Titanic. And over the course of the journey back to the United States, my father spent a lot of time playing cards with this man, and this man insisted that the story of the iceberg having been struck was to conceal the real cause of the disaster. And we have always speculated that this possible cover-up was for insurance purposes. Well, thank you, Mr. Dybell, for that story. And thank you for the information for coming on our program. Thank you. Now we have Dr. Robert Essenhai, professor of mechanical engineering at Ohio State University and a noted expert on steam and coal gas explosions. Dr. Essenhai, welcome. Thank you. Now, you've had an opportunity uh, to consider this new evidence. Was the hole caused by the coal fire, do you think? No, I don't think so. Uh, there are two major reasons against this. If you look at the model, the bunker <clears throat> that could have produced the gases is just forward of this first funnel. Mm -hmm. You can see where the hole is, it's marked on the model, and they're just out of line, they don't coincide. Now the second reason is that if those gases were there and they did explode, then there are chutes uh, there for filling the bunker they have light tops. The explosion would simply go up the chutes, blow off the tops, and they would never be able to blow out those plates. But I think one of the interesting things is that this bunker fire may have a bigger bearing on the whole um, accident than just uh, may appear from this. There were something like four or 500 tons of coal left in the bunker at the time of, uh, that it sank. The fire had apparently been burning all the time, and I did a calculation and reached the conclusion that after about four or five days, that fire would be starting to accelerate. If the firemen fighting it thought at that time that it was getting out of control, and they reported this to the captain, it would only be necessary for him to believe it was getting out of control, and he would at that time have two problems. He would have the information that the, uh, there was ice ahead, and he would also have an, the information about the, the fire escaping. So then he has a quandary. If he reduces speed uh, to avoid the ice, 
<clears throat> then he could run, in, run the risk of a major fire coming out on the ship and burning the ship. If, on the other hand, uh, he maintains his speed, obviously he has the risk of, uh, of hit, striking um, uh, an iceberg. And that is quite a quandary. Yes, it is. Well, thank you, Dr. S. and I appreciate you coming on the program. Thank you very much. Well, scientists may not know all the reasons for this 30-foot hole for years. Its causes, its effects on the sinking will be the subject of lively controversy for a long time to come. Not until the French developed Nautil, the world's most advanced deep diving sub, was this vital new evidence of the Titanic's 30-foot wound discovered. No previous expedition revealed this critical new information. In a moment, we'll be seeing this miracle machine, Nautil. This sparkling new center for science and industry here in La Villette section of Paris is the city's pride and joy, and rightfully so. This spectacular building, one of many which forms an entire cultural center, features exhibitions which encourage visitors to become participants in the very latest scientific and technical developments. There are no don't touch signs here. Most displays provide a hands-on experience for the visitor. Here at Lavalette, the visitor sees a full-scale model of Nautil and begins to appreciate the triumph of its engineering. As visitors lift their eyes, they're reminded that inner space technology is just as complex as that required to reach the stars. Now, we're about to take you along as the team from Ifremer returns again to the Titanic. We will see how the deep diving submersible Nautil recovers priceless objects from the debris field, that area between the two broken parts of the ship. Here now, one of the most successful deep sea expeditions of the century. expedition back to the Titanic combined all the elements of truly great adventure. In charge of the expedition, the scientists of Ifremer, the French Institute for Research and Exploration of the Sea. The success of the expedition demonstrated the degree of expertise which pushed the frontiers of underwater technology to a level of excellence never before achieved. The expedition was headquartered on Ifremer's research vessel, Nadir. Among the experts aboard, Mission Commander, Captain Cadonfleck. Submarine Captain, Nargiole. World-renowned oceanographer, Dr. Joseph McGuinness. Underwater photographer, Ralph White. Nearby Nadir is the big yellow ship, Abe Supporter. It provides housing and supplies for the expedition, but most important, its crew has the dangerous job of launching and recovering the retrieval baskets. This vessel, the Nadir, is the mothership for what may appear to be just a little yellow submarine. It is named the Nautil, and in reality, it is the most sophisticated deep diving submersible in the world today. Now two years old, it's only 25 feet long and 15 feet tall, but she took seven years to design and cost $20 million to build. Now take a look at the front of this amazing submersible. Well, this is where most of the action takes place. The crewmen inside look out through these three portals. And from there, they operate these two electronically controlled arms. They're used to recover a wide range of objects from the ocean floor, some weighing as much as several hundred pounds. Others as weightless as a tiny teacup. Now, beneath these arms is a small basket in which some of the smallest items are placed. 
they're so good at manipulating these arms. I'm told the crewmen can practically thread a needle on the ocean floor. Elsewhere on the front of this Nautil, a variety of sophisticated cameras for still pictures and television, and a powerful 4,000 watt underwater lighting system. Any way you look at it, <laughs> who would have believed it? Now, with the divers aboard, Nautil prepares for launching. Titanic should be straight down. We'll find out when we return in just a moment. This is the bridge of the Nadir, the command center of this expedition and headquarters for the submersible operations. And back here is the communication center, the link from the mothership to the Nortil where the most sophisticated acoustic communications, sonar, and computer systems maintain constant contact with the submersible. And actually, track it as it moves across the ocean floor. That's 12,500 feet below, two and a half miles down. As Nautil descends, she enters a world of total darkness, of absolute silence. Two and a half miles down, the ocean pressure will reach an incredible 6,000 pounds per square inch. At Nortil's core, a seven-foot titanium sphere. Cramped inside, three divers and a massive array of guidance, navigational, and communication equipment. The co-pilot and observer recline while the pilot sits. All three look out through portholes of foot-thick glass. Prior to the dive, Sub-Commander Nagiole and photographer Ralph White plan a mission. The sub will drop here. Yes. And maneuver in towards the bow section of the Titanic, and most of its operation will be on the bow. And the bonus. Transponders, small sonar devices which emit pulsing signals, have earlier been placed on the bottom. These signals are used by the Nadir and the Nautil to home in on the Titanic. Do you think we can go up and check the bridge today? See if there's a bridge yes. under that overhang? Yes. Coming out of total darkness, the lights begin to pick up the ghostly image of the Titanic's bow. No matter how many times one dives to the Titanic, the sheer power of the sea, of what she's done to her, leaves you in shock. Looking down, we see the auxiliary anchor nested right next to the boom. covered by the rivers of rust pouring down on it from the horizon pipe. In a few years, there'll be nothing left in the shape of an anchor. Using a brush, the Nautil's robotic arm gently sweeps away 75 years of rust from the port bow. Slowly the letter A appears. Then a T. You can barely see it, but the 
name of the ship is definitely there. Grotesque streamers formed by bacteria and rust run down the ship like poisonous rivers, devouring and destroying the metal beneath. They drape the sunken ship like tangled ropes of Spanish moss. Coming up from the port side, we cross over the anchor chain and the main deck, which was once rich teak, now all eaten away by wood-boring organisms. This bow section is the only part of the Titanic that remains somewhat intact. The last part that reminds us of Her Majesty. Up the fallen foremast toward the lookout post. It was from here the two men first saw the iceberg that would do this great lady in. Below it lies a wing bridge, crushed beneath the fallen mast. Farther up the mast, we see where steel was joined to wood, creating the fabulous height of that mast. And twisted back into the wreckage, a davit which swung a lifeboat out that night. You can't help wondering if it held Molly Brown's boat, or if it lowered the one Mrs. Strauss refused to get into. The ship's steam steering gear, its wooden wheel long ago eaten away. Below the port wing bridge, one of the ship's engine telegraphs. Whoever used it to signal the engine room to a full stop reacted too late. This door behind the bridge led into the boat deck officer's quarters. Coming down the port side of the boat deck, again, rust and decay have taken away the beauty of this once proud ship. Here we reach the point where the proud lady's back was broken, snapped like a twig, if you will, separating the huge bow section from the smaller stern section. And here the decks drop off sharply downward, collapsed one on the other, as though smashed flat by a giant fist. While no one can accurately describe precisely what happened the night the great ship sank, the wreck does provide some clues. The prevailing theory is that when the Titanic collided with the iceberg, it opened a gaping hole in the bow, allowing huge quantities of water to pour in. The bow, filling with water, dipped deeper and deeper beneath the surface, forcing the stern, which was filled with air, higher and higher above the waterline. As the ship began to slide forward, there was a twisting and torquing motion as the metals ripped apart. The bow tears away and heads for the bottom, while the stern section appears to right itself before tilting skyward and slipping beneath the surface. As the two sections of the ship sank, debris from the break emptied out and fell to the bottom. The two sections of Titanic came to rest some two-thirds of a mile apart, and in between, the massive debris field. giant three-story reciprocating engines.
It's a tangled mass of wreckage. The awesome destructive power of the sea is right here in front of you, in this twisted mass of rusted metal. Finally, beneath the stern, one of Titanic's three giant propellers, seen for the first time by anyone since the ship was launched, and now half buried in the mud. Between the two broken parts of the Titanic, a debris field covering three quarters of a mile, scattered across it, thousands of objects which fell to the bottom as the Titanic broke apart and sank. In a moment, we'll see how Nautil brings them to the surface. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Paris and our return to the Titanic. The support ship Abbe does much more than supply Ephraim's expedition team with toothpaste and groceries. Abe helps lower and recover the wire cages used to retrieve large and heavy objects. The recovered artifacts must be protected from exposure to the air and are stored in freshwater tanks until they can reach the preservation and restoration experts of Electricité de France, EDF, here in Paris. Recoveries by Nautil from the debris field virtually filled the Abbey's holding tanks. Now let's see some of the things being saved from destruction. The ocean floor is littered with the objects which hurtled down from the breaking ship. Champagne and ordinary wine bottles. A metal tank, first thought to be a safe. A leaded glass window from the first-class salon. The stern bridge compass and binnacle. Nautil's articulated arm gently plucks a light fixture from the wreckage. Dr. Joseph McInnes comments on the mission. When you read about this expedition, hear about it it is controversial but but you have to be here to get a real sense of what's happening these are men who are not pursuing treasure uh, they have found some some objects of great value but the mood here is diving to learn about this ship to bring back material to try to reconstruct that story and I think if the treasures are evident at all they're evident in the documentation, in the science, and in the shared experiences of these men. Although many smaller items were placed in Ortil's own small basket, the larger pieces required special transfer cages equipped with transponders. They were deployed near the site the sub would be working in the debris field. Once it reaches the bottom, the basket is gripped by one of Nautil's arms and towed to our working position.
Nortiel approaches one of the stern bridge telegraphs. The top of the telegraph had separated from the stanchion, but they retrieve both parts and will reassemble them on the surface. When the basket is full, its ballast is removed, making it rise to the surface. Transponders guide the Abay supporter and the recovery team to a position close to where the basket will surface. Frogmen attach a safety line and then place a net over the top of the basket to prevent any small items from being washed out by any swell on the surface. Spring lines are then attached to the basket to prevent it crashing into anything, ship or crew for that matter. A 1,500-pound basket swinging free could cause serious injury to the artifacts or to any crew member in harm's way. Watching the French crew aboard both the Nadir and the Abbe is like watching the best corps de ballet in the world. It's a combination of coordination and style, and it results in safety and success. There wasn't a single accident, injury, or lost item on the entire expedition. See the inside, glass is a little cracked, perfect condition. This is the binnacle which held the compass on the stern of the Titanic. Here is the uh, stern uh, rudder indicator. We have port, starboard. This indicates where the rudder is, and this is where the ship's wheel was attached. This would be what controlled the rudder. You can see the force of the sea is sheared off this piece of metal. Also, it has sheared all the bolts that mounted it to the wing or to the stern bridge of the Titanic. But it survived in one piece. We now have the complete stern bridge. One of the most fascinating items, as well as one of the most difficult to recover, was the assistant purser safe. When we return, we'll see how this heavy safe was raised two and a half miles from the bottom of the North Atlantic. Stay with us. Welcome back. The debris field between the two broken pieces of the ship covers three quarters of a mile. It's filled with thousands of items of historical interest. Now, as we rejoin the expedition, 
we'll see the recovery of some rare and wonderful pieces. We'll also see the recovery of the only safe we found on the bottom. And tonight, we'll find out what surprises it contains. One of the most astonishing sights was this group of plates fanned out across the bottom like a deck of cards. After more than 75 years on the bottom, they look as though they could have been placed there yesterday. The suction device at the end of Nautil's robotic arm gently retrieved every one of them without damaging or losing a single plate. Across from Southampton's medieval bar gate, we found the original supplier of all the China to the White Star Lines, a company called Stoniers, which is still in business. General Manager John Fox. There is no doubt in my mind that we would have supplied all the china and glassware on board the, the Titanic. They're in remarkably good condition. They've obviously been packed in a chest or a crate of some sort, which has uh, rotted away in time. The chef would have used that for cooking, uh, for cooking egg dishes in the main, I think, or spaghetti dishes. He would have, because of the nature of the dish, he could have put that straight under the grill. This is interesting, this is a teapot. It's a rather ornate teapot, uh, as we can see from the lid there. And it's a little difficult to say exactly what that's made of, whether it's earthenware or china. If it's earthenware, it would tend to be used in one of the lower class restaurants. If it was in the first class restaurant, then it would be bone china. I'm surprised that there's no uh, marine incrustation at all, but they look as good as the day they were put on the ship. One of the most extraordinary finds on the ocean floor was this assistant purser safe lying in the debris field. Not only one of the heaviest and most difficult to recover, it was also potentially one of the most valuable. To bring it to the surface, tested the ingenuity of the submersible team and the capabilities of the Nortil. For the recovery attempt, the divers used a rope sling to lift the safe into a basket which had been dropped nearby. The effort involved careful coordination between the pilot, co-pilot and observer. It was a painstakingly slow, delicate process. Uh, Nadir, Nadir de Nautil pour contact. Oui, reçu. Uh, je vais vous demander... When the Nautil reported it had the safe secured in the basket, the recovery team on the Nadir went into action. The Zodiacs with the frogmen were launched, and all eyes studied the surface, watching for signs that the recovery basket had completed the long and treacherous trip from the ocean floor. Once safely on deck, the unusual contents of the basket attracted the attention of nearly everyone on board. To protect it from the air, the safe is immediately wrapped and will be stored in fresh water. Captain Roark displays the manufacturer's medallion. This is uh, the plague which was fitted on the safe well, just recovered. Uh, as you can see, it comes from Thomas Perry and Sons Limited, Belson. After the safe is secured on board Nadir, Nautil completes a nearly two-hour ascent to the surface. Like most of her dives, this one has lasted 12 hours. Frogmen attach tow lines to move her into position for recovery. Out of the shared experience of this two-month French-American expedition, a friendship and camaraderie has been forged with bonds stronger and far more enduring than steel.
American team member Jennifer Carter became the first woman in history to ever dive to the Titanic. This French initiation welcomes her into the club. After the kisses, an egg shampoo. Quickly followed by a bucket of bills, or so they say. And the drink of choice? Well, you don't have to be French to love champagne. The records have been totaled, and they tell a story of amazing accomplishment. In all, the Nautil made the two and a half mile descent 32 times, and spent more than 160 hours on the ocean floor. During that time, thousands of pictures and over 60 hours of video recorded the story of the Titanic today. And more than 900 artifacts were brought to the surface. These items will be scrutinized and analyzed for years to come. Hopefully, one day, they may tell us even more. Everyone agrees this has been one of the most successful expeditions of all time. In a moment, we'll be back to take a closer look at the artifacts and the opening of the safe from the RMS Titanic. <laughs> EDF, a French state-owned corporation is preserving every item recovered from the Titanic debris field. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Jacques Montluçon. Well, hello, Jacques. Hello. Now, you brought a tape that shows how the preservation process works. Will you explain this for us, Jacques? With pleasure. I'm going to show you those wonderful images made by Paris University experts. Great. So, those, there are so many artifacts that we have to uh, classify them on computer and to analyze them like this glass case, which we shall first analyze under a microscope in order to see which is the state of the fibers of the leather. And after that, we shall determine the treatment Here are the papers, probably banknotes. And we analyze them again, we observe them, we clean them a little bit. And here you will see the fibers of the papers. And we decided to treat them using electricity. The electricity will clean them deeply. We put them in an electrical field and they are clean, deeply clean, like this one, a dollar, I think. The porcelain and the glasses just need a simple cleansing operation. It's much easier. But the metallic artifacts, like this button, are in real danger. Here, under the microscope, you will see the white star emblem. The white star exactly as a starfish. And look how it is corroded. Look at that. It's really corroded. It's in real danger. It's really corroded. It's in real danger. Without treatment, it won't bear a contact with the air. So we have to treat them by electrolysis. And now they are treated. The first button being treated. Same thing for this telephone this navy phone, which is, which is uh, having an electrolysis process. And the best example is this ladle here, which is in very bad condition, as you can see. It's full of, con of concretions, 
And here you will see the process itself. It's really live. You will see the impurities extracted in front of you by electricity. Look at them. Here they are. And after that, this ladle will bear the contact with the air. Look at it. And this cherub, a wonderful piece, which is apparently in very good condition, but the metal itself is poisoned and we, are, we have really to purify it. It's a rescuing operation. That's what we do in this electrolysis process, which is now operating in front of you. The electricity will gently and deeply extract the destructive chlorides. After that, this cherub will be saved. Good luck, little cherub. Well, that's just great, Jacques. Congratulations on the work your organization is doing. I see the... Uh, the ladle there, it does look like a new piece of merchandise after the treatment. Ah, let's see, what other artifacts do we have here? Oh, the bell. You know, the way I think, that could have been the bell that sounded the alarm for the, the crew and the passengers aboard the Titanic, but I doubt it, it's a little small. The telegraph. There we go. And I understand that this was recovered and it was uh, on the uh, go button, the telegraph. That's fascinating. Now, this ship's telephone may have been used to convey Captain Smith's last order to his officers and crew. Be British, lads. Be British. You know, among our black tie audience here in Paris tonight, we're fortunate to have with us four world-renowned experts. Coins, Sabine Bourget. Currency, Yasha Berazina. In jewelry, Veronique Maharop and Max Pilgra. Among the items uh, we've received, two are very special. The assistant purse is safe and an ordinary looking satchel. We're about to open both before this worldwide audience. Stay tuned and we'll all find out what surprises they contain. We are joined now by Robert Chapaz, Chairman of Taurus International. As you know, EDF has been protecting and preserving all artifacts from the moment each one left the sea. We found one safe at the Titanic site. It appears to have been the safe of the assistant purser. For the first time, you here in Paris and our audience around the world will discover what surprises it contains. The assistant purser safe has been partially restored and placed inside this outer safe by experts in order to prevent further deterioration and to secure its contents. We're now going to open this first safe. Officer? Please? Well, be careful. Oh, I see. Inside, looks like a recovered satchel. And that in itself is almost a miracle. Here we go, be careful, gentlemen. <laughs> now, how a, a satchel leather at that could survive the pressure at the bottom for so long. Well, all right, gentlemen, I guess we get on with it. The time has come.
Now, what is that? Probably banknotes, I think. Banknotes? I suppose. They are oh. tied up. So I should together. recognize a Yankee dollar when I see it, but I don't. Okay. <laughs> That's quite a lot. Oh, on the paper, probably. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. No, hey, no, perhaps who's going to handle the cash? You want to cheat. Okay. Okay. All right, great. You look at those and inspect them, and I'll be back and we'll get your opinions on or more paper money. Yeah. Yeah. In quite good condition. Oh. No. This is a purse. Uh, you don't have a job on your hands. Careful. Open it now. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Oh, what are these things? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Put that in here as well. Okay. Probably. We need to choose them. Now, who's going to handle this? What? Ladies first. What? What? What for billet? Grand. Grand. Still, notes. More, more, more notes. More cash. Yeah. Yeah? Gosh. Okay. What have you got there, Jacques? Give me a small oh. box. Probably. Let's see the camera. See that. Four ties. Four ties? Yeah. Yeah. In hand. And that's the lid of a box with initials. You open it? No, no it's I open. Think maybe, perhaps you better open this. We got initials there? Yeah. Okay. It Necklace. looks like. Maybe. R L B. R L B. Well, let me bring these things over here. Now you look at uh, the cash right there. Do you want to be looking at this and see what's in there? RLB. In convex. Okay. This as well. This. Small box, please. Oh, you're taking it out of there, are you? Yeah. 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 Let's show these up to the camera. Gee, that looks like something I lost last week. And yeah. some coins, yeah. nice coins inside. Wait a minute. A watch. A watch? Yeah. Put that in here, I guess, with jewels, right? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. okay. Give that to you. Hang on. Let me see how carefully that shows. Here again. Yeah, I guess it needs a lot of cleaning. Yeah. 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 What have nice we got here? Box. Petit boîte. Huh? Who's going to take care of this? Now you take a long study on these things because. Petit boîte. Petit boîte. As you pull these things out, Jacques. Yeah. Explain this little jewelry box. No, it has nothing. No nothing. bottom, you know. Probably it's a jewel ah. box or something exists, uh, but I don't know exactly. Initials here? Yeah. Point to the same initial RLB. Yeah. RLB again, huh? There's a watch. Put that in here, I guess. Yeah. In hand. In hand. Here we go. I want you to examine these things and... Why don't we take a look at the second safe right now? Okay. 
Well. Great. And let's see what the, uh, the recover safe inside might contain. Would you open this one, please? Jacques. You know, this is the actual assistant purser safe from the Titanic, which was restored by EDF. It's almost impossible to believe that it, that it still exists. And that's it. Here with us tonight in Paris. What have we got in there? Looks like a bunch of coins, huh? Yeah. All right, I'll take... Uh... That's great. You need to open the bag. Oh, yes? The bag. You better do it, then. Well, 75 years ago, somebody made a yeah. real good knot. Indeed. Oh, yeah. Old coins. Old coins. Yellow coins. So Yellow coins. We'll put them over here. Who's our coin expert? Madame? Here we go. Boy. Huh? Now, where's that thing that had the initials on it? Initials? Yeah. Here that has Amy, that has a name on it. A name? Yes. And what is the name on it? Can you Amy. see it? Amy? Yes. Amy. Amy in Little Diamond. And this one here? Or Annie. I tried to open it. All right. In our computer, we have the name of every passenger on the Titanic. When we return, our computer check will hopefully identify the owner of these items. And we will also hear the exciting analysis of experts on these priceless recoveries. We'll be back in just a moment. I'm looking at the list of passengers. We find one person with the initials RLB, you know, who might be in fact the owner of this jewelry. That passenger are Mr. and Mrs. R.L. Beckwith. You know, if there are any survivors or heirs of the Beckwiths, this could be yours. Anyway, how are we doing with our uh, analysis on the coins? There are a lot of them here, too, aren't there? Yeah. Uh, well, you've got some gold coins, English ones. English? Yeah, it's the main, uh, it's the part, the most important, all that gold coins, you know? I see. Sovereigns. Uh, and uh, we can think that uh, the world treasure is around uh, five thousand dollars. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. That's great. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, they'll put put on exhibition. You know, but we have also the portemonnaie, and that is uh, the purse. It's quite the human thing. Yes. You know. I hope they can preserve that as well. Yeah. And what did you come up with now with the bills? Well, the it's absolutely amazing that this should have been able to be preserved even in this state. Many of them you can make out the various denominations. And there are bills of all the various American denominations. I'm disappointed there aren't any English banknotes. I thought sailing from the state there would be some. But these show the denominations from the two to the ten dollar and there's a fifty dollar in there. There is American American money? All American money. Some of them have still got the original band around them. Obviously this is one of the reasons the uh, they've been lasted even this long. Uh, there is one that has been preserved and obviously restored here, which shows it to have been a national currency issue of about 1902. It shows William McKinley, by the way, who oh, was really? the 25th president, who had been... Um, How'd you know that, 25th president? president? Oh, McKinley on the series of <laughs> the no, U.S. notes, for sure. But what's interesting is that, if, if I'm not mistaken, the back of this note will have shown, in fact, the uh, portrait of liberty to, with two vessels 
selling on it. All of the ten dollars of this series would be the selling that. So that's now this is one after being treated by the uh, French Institute, and this is how it, it was when they picked yeah, it up. It's absolutely amazing the, the restoration that's been done on that action. I see. Well, thank you. All right, now with the loophole, what do we got here? I have a very sentimental little pendant here. It's a little gold pendant with a tiny little um, old mine cut diamond. And the inscription says, May this be your lucky star. Really? This is a very nice little filigree pendant with, um, it's about 1905 to 1910. And it has little old mine diamonds in it. Here's another little piece here. This little bracelet is the one that has Amy in diamonds. You've got to look into that. In diamonds, huh? Yes. Well, they've survived 75 years under the water. It's, uh, yes, it's incredible. Proof that diamonds are a girl's best friend. And what have we got here? I have a nice, uh, nice little uh, uh, display set of uh, stick pins. And it's strange that among these stick pins, one of them is engraved RLB. Mm -hmm. And uh, these men had several. Uh, one was a scarab, the other one is, uh, is decorated as a little diamond flower. Uh, it's, it's nice. Uh, I have also uh, what seems to be a cover, the cover of a box, but unfortunately, have uh, only the cover with oh, RLB also. Well, uh, Jacques is there taking any stuff uh, out of the valise? Oh, oh, here. And there. rings? Maybe. Rings and that. What is that? I don't know exactly, but it has inscription. We'll there. find out. They've got loopholes over here. Uh -huh. Here we are. Oh, rings marvelous. and diamonds. And here as well. Yeah. More coins with a chain. We'll give that to you. You? Well, are you still taking things out of there, Jacques? Yeah. The razor blade box, I think. The razor blade oh, box. Yes. <laughs> All right. Do you get that? If you look for maybe we can find some initials on that. Uh huh. If you get to a hair clipper, you know it's yeah, not mine. <laughs> The Any other new discoveries? That's interesting. What would that be? Pushing the diamond in the middle, sparkling. Any initials on that? No. No, nothing. Nothing, huh? No. Oh, here's a little padlock. Maybe it says something. Yeah, so far we have the initials R.L.B. It says 18 carat. Got a little padlock. I see. Oh, and the watch. Here, I'll leave that with you as well. Well, to the scientists of Vermeer and EDF, to all of us who wanted the brave men and women who were tragically lost on that freezing April night, the restoration of these priceless mementos has been a labor of love. Their presentation, a gift to the future. Not one item will be sold. It is the intention and the promise of our expedition to display them with dignity only in the most select museums in the world. And then, to give them their deserved place in history by maintaining them in a permanent collection. And now, the time has come to thank all of you here tonight, to the wonderful people at La Villette Center for Science and Industry, to our honored guests, to our audience across the world who shared this very special event with us tonight.